how do you pick a girlfriend? How do you pick a wife? You pick someone you like. This is the most important in life. If you want to have clients, whether you're a doctor, a carpenter, a blacksmith, or an electrician, the most important is that you can establish a trust relationship. So what's up everyone, today I'm sitting down with Mark Faber in Chiang Mai in Thailand. So how's it going, Mark? Everything is fine, thank you very much. Okay, good to have you here. We are at your office here, which is wonderful. It's thank you. pretty big, I like it. It's awesome. So today I want to go into a little bit about who you are, a bit of your story, how you've been able to okay. become who you are today. So you want to... I have no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to give people maybe a little bit of background about who you are and what you do. Well, I was born in Switzerland uh, in 1946 and I went to school in primary school in Zurich and Geneva. Uh, therefore, I speak also French. And then I studied in Zurich at uh, college. And after finishing school, I went to university in Zurich. And then uh, I wrote a thesis about the financial reform of Robert Peel which was in 1842 in England. He's essentially the first prime minister in England who brought uh, England from a system of protectionism to free trade, and he introduced an income tax. At the time, it was levied on very few people because you had to have a certain minimum income to qualify for paying the income tax. And it was only at 7%, <laughs> so you can see how governments are. When they start something, they go further and further and further. And uh, after that, I worked for an American investment bank in New York. And after that, uh, I was sent to develop their business in Asia. And I went to Hong Kong and I worked for that investment bank called White Weld until 78. And then they were taken over by Merrill Lynch and I didn't want to work for Mary Lynch, so I opened the offices for Drexel Burnham Lambert, which became famous uh, through their activities in junk bonds. And when they went out of business in 1990, I opened my own business in Hong Kong, and I still have it. But I no longer live in Hong Kong. I have an office in Hong Kong. But I rarely uh, go to my office because you can do everything nowadays through the internet. Mm -hmm. So th th that's nice. So you opened your office in Hong Kong with your company. And was this a tough decision or did you want to open your office and kind of go on your own? Yes, I, because I had worked for two American investment bank, I had built up a clientele. So it's not that I started in a business all by myself without an experience. I had established clients, so it was easier to start your own business. But uh, everybody has to realize once he's on his own, he's on his own. You know, you make a mistake, you're responsible for it. And if the fax machine or the printer breaks down, you have to fix it. <laughs> There's nobody else around. So uh, basically it's a different life than working in a large corporation where if anything goes wrong, the corporation can somehow help you. But I prefer to be on my own. I think for most people, to be on their own is a better way to live. Uh, you have more freedom. You, like, I live here, I still work. But I can work in the morning or I can work at night. Uh, I don't have a boss that tells me you have to be at a meeting at 8 in the morning to listen to me morning meeting notes and so forth. Yeah, I think I agree with that too. I think I prefer being on my own as well. And so back then, what were you doing? Were you investing in companies or...? Yes, all my life I essentially spent uh, trying to identify unusual investment opportunities and uh, managing people's money. So this is my main activity. I've never done anything else. I had investments that involved me in doing other things, but uh, all my life it was about investing money. Mm -hmm. 
were you the one responsible of doing everything, which means like the marketing of your company and, and investing as well, or did you have a, a team of people? I did everything myself, but of course I had supporting staff uh, to do the back office functions, and I had some salesmen uh, who covered other clients than mine, or they brought clients to the company and they managed uh, their accounts and so forth. But basically, uh, if you run a small business, you do a lot of things yourself. I mean, you develop the product, you develop the ideas, and you market the ideas. Uh, the marketing was more through my newsletters. I have two reports. Uh, a website report that goes out by email every month and I have a printed report, the gloom, boom and doom report that goes out uh, in a printed form, as sent out by letter. I guess back then you didn't have that, when you began the... the... I started writing very early uh, because I disagreed with most of the research that okay. my firms or Wall Street produced, I thought they always want to be optimistic and always uh, ask people to buy things and I disagreed frequently with their views. So I started writing already in the 70s. One of the reasons I succeeded reasonably well already at the beginning is that when I was in New York, uh, it was the year 1970, 71, and there were always rumors and fears that the U.S. would devalue uh, the U.S. dollar because at the time, 1970, the U.S. dollar was grossly overvalued against the DM, the Deutsche Mark, and the Swiss franc, and other European currencies. And uh, one weekend in the summer of 71, I think it was early August, I wrote a report, not a long report, but a short report, why and how Europeans and foreigners could hedge against a devaluation of the dollar. So that in the US, hardly anyone paid attention to exchange rates for them, the dollar was a dollar. Even today, for most Americans, they don't understand what foreign exchange is. So I wrote a report how to protect yourself, and I said you have to buy stocks in the US that will go up if the dollar is devalued, because they be, these companies become more competitive. Anyway, I sent this report out to all the offices of white wealth around the world. And over the weekend, the dollar was devalued. Uh, that was the Nixon uh, devaluation in 71. So when I came to the office the next day, the whole investment committee of white wealth was around my desk waiting for me. And they said, how did you know that this would happen? I said, I didn't know, but it's likely that it would happen. Anyway, so uh, that gave me a boost in that company and they trusted my judgment about currencies. And how did you learn these things? Is this something that you had a passion for and you, you learned all by yourself or did you go through a course or you had any mentors well, along the, the way? The thing is I went to uh, university and first in Zurich and studied economics. I didn't study very much because at the time I was in the Swiss ski club, a uh, ski uh, racing club. Uh, ski team mm. and so I was all winter long racing uh, on alpine races but I went to some courses and we had in Zurich at the time two or three professors that were world famous one was called Haller and he had uh, provided the intellectual background or the theoretical background why a value-added tax was an extremely fair tax yeah, as a measure to raise revenues for the government. And so I studied financial fiscal policies under him and he had also written two books, uh, fiscal policies and one about taxes. Because when you raise taxes or you lower tax, 
uh, if I raise taxes on you, it's not sure that you will pay the tax under some conditions, you can roll it over to somebody else. Like, I raise sales tax, the department store may be able to roll over either most of it or some of it to the consumer, the buyers of products in the department store. Anyway, so it's a complex matter. And the other professor, he was uh, more of a macroeconomic historian, uh, Lutz, and he had argued uh, for many years about flexible exchange rates, because at the time uh, there was still the agreement of Bretton Woods in place, which fixed the exchange rates between the dollar and other currencies. And the mechanism uh, that was applied was essentially to settle everything in gold. It was not the pure gold standard, but the gold-linked standard. So my professor had always argued for flexible exchange rates, which have a huge advantage. They have some disadvantages, but in general, they impose some discipline on countries. And so when I went to New York, I had a reasonably good uh, macroeconomic background. And also the, the thesis I wrote, the PhD I took, was about essentially fiscal policy, because when Robert Peel introduced the income tax in 1842, he repealed uh, import duties. So there was a shortfall in revenues for the government, but that was offset by the introduction of the income tax. And then when I was on Wall Street, I attended various courses and I became interested in technical analysis. And I met most of the great technicians at that time. And uh, I became interested uh, or more interested in economic history. So I also met some professors in economic history. And I mean, you know, you can see my library. I have a, a vast uh, collection of economic books, the classical economic books, and some first editions and so forth. So I think, yes, I studied a lot later as, as I worked, because I was interested in economics. And I was interested in trying to make an honest buck. <laughs> so you are combining technical analysis and kind of the fundamentals, the macroeconomic. Yes, I look at both. I mean, if I see a chart that looks interesting for either a sector or for a company, then I ask myself, why is the stock uh, or the sector breaking out on the upside or on the downside? Is there, a re there must be a reason, either improving fundamentals or deteriorating fundamentals. And then I look for the fundamentals. Equally, I may get a report by some service provider that recommends a company and before I go into the details, I look at the chart, whether the chart looks attractive or not. So it's a combination of both. What would you describe as a chart that's attractive? What does it look like? An attractive chart, as an example, was gold in the late 1990s. Gold had peaked out in 1980 at $850 in January 1980. And after that, like silver and platinum, it had declined. And by the late 1990s, uh, it had traded for a long time between say 250 to $350. So it had essentially an almost 20 years bear market. During that time, uh, financial assets, bonds and stocks had gone up a lot and there was also inflation. There was disinflation, but nevertheless, the price level had gone up. And so gold had built what we call a saucer bottom during the years 1985, after the peak in 1980 and extending to the late 1990s. In 
nine, it was still at two hundred fifty-five dollars. And I thought, compared to say equities, and compared to the overall price level in the world, and to the expansion of the world because China had begun to open up in 1978, I said, compared to all this, the price is very low. Equally, oil had peaked out on the spot market at over $50 in 1980. By 1998, it was at less than $12. <coughs> so, I thought, commodities had all that needed for a major low, namely a long-lasting bear market. And prices are relatively low compared to other things in the world. And so I became attracted uh, to gold and silver and other commodities at the time. And then also, I had uh, gone to China early, already in 1980, and uh, I saw the opening of the south of the Pearl River Delta. In other words, I realized early on this China is going to be some huge thing in terms of additional demand and when you industrialize you need more commodities and so I thought the additional demand coming from China will boost commodity prices so this was another reason to be positive about commodities and precious metals that's interesting so you spoke about China so do you think these days there's other countries that are kind of replacing China like China used to be before, like starting to develop and showing some big upside? Yes, I mean, at the time, you know, Hong Kong had, was a de highly developed city already. And if you go back to 1970, 1970, the whole of Asia was poor. With the exception of one country, Japan had already developed a lot because they had received a lot of aid from the US and uh, technical know-how. So after the war, the Japanese, they re rebuilt Japan, like the German rebuilt Germany after the war. It uh, took off economically, but South Korea, Taiwan, and the rest of Asia was still dirt poor. And then I saw how Taiwan and uh, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong developed in the 70s. So when China opened up, I realized very quickly this is going to be a huge thing. And not much happened initially because uh, it was an experiment when they opened up. They formed some special economic zones in the Pearl River Delta, that's the uh, area of Hong Kong, Guangdong province. But then uh, the modernization and the opening of China went further and soon Shanghai opened up and other cities mostly along the coast and so as soon the whole country was an economic special zone and was growing very rapidly and so uh, actually in 2001 I wrote a book called uh, Tomorrow's Gold Asia's Age of Discovery in other words, it was not about necessarily gold, but it was about the rise of Asia economically and uh, also geopolitically. And I had written before a small book about the rise and the fall of great cities, in which I uh, had a very rather negative view about Hong Kong. Because I said Hong Kong was the only city where there was a bridge between China and the rest of the world. All the essential commerce and financial transactions went through Hong Kong. But with the opening of China, Hong Kong got a lot of competition, which has led to some disappointment among the young population in Hong Kong and the recent demonstrations. Do you think the same thing happened these days with countries like uh, Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos? Are they at the point where China was in the 70s? Correct. I think, economically speaking, the greatest opportunity in Asia is in Indochina. In other words, in the East, facing essentially China, Vietnam, 
looks like a snake along the coast. And then in the northwest from Vietnam, you have Laos. Southwest of Vietnam, you have Cambodia. And then east of Laos and Cambodia, you have Thailand. South, you have Malaysia. North, you have uh, Kunming, Yunnan province in China. And then further west, you have Myanmar and uh, India and Bangladesh. That region, uh, further south uh, of Malaysia, you have Singapore, Indonesia, and in the north, you have essentially uh, Bhutan and Nepal. That re whole entire region is going to be a boom town. Already now, we have uh, growth rates in Cambodia of around 8%, but it's not problem-free. There are many geopolitics that uh, play a role. And I always say, in Asia, everything will be fine in the long run, provided, and this is the most important precondition, provided we have peace. If the Americans start to meddle as much in Asia as they did in the Middle East, they can destabilize the whole region. And they may do it. They may do it. What are your thoughts on Thailand? Because it seems like if you go to Bangkok or some of these places, it seems like it's really well built and already way to develop. But I guess the country overall is not that advanced, if you look at the, the whole picture. It's a miracle that the Thais <laughs> were able to build the buildings they have in Bangkok and the infrastructure. I think they must have used a lot of foreigners. And, uh, you know, the, the view of Thailand for a foreigner who just goes to Bangkok is deceptive. Yeah. Uh, one of the major problems of Thailand is if you look at surveys about the quality of education, Thailand is among the worst countries in the world. And there was recently a survey of the best universities in the world. So they listed 600 universities around the world. Most of the very best are, say, in the US, you know, Yale, Stanford, uh, Harvard, and so forth, Wharton. And then you have a few European schools. In Switzerland, we have the uh, Technical College in Zurich, where Einstein used to study and teach, uh, which is uh, still one of the top technical schools in the world. But in Thailand, they didn't place one university, not one among the 600 list of the best universities in the world, not one. That's surprising. And uh, I always say, Unless Thailand really makes a major effort to have a better educational system, uh, the country will lag behind. Because if you look at Vietnam, Vietnam began to open up 10 years after China, in about 1989. And initially it was very slow. And it's still slow. It's a very a bureaucratic country with a very strong government. You know, everything is controlled. But anyway, economically, uh, the country has done very well. And when the trade war began, or after the trade war began, production shifted away from China. You know, foreign, because most, not most, but say half, the exports from China come from multinationals. They are foreign companies based in China, and they produce goods in China and export them to the US and Europe. So these multinationals, they are Japanese, American, Taiwanese, South Koreans mostly. They shifted their production out of China into other countries, and these other countries in Asia their exports began to boom. But Thai exports didn't benefit at all from this shift. But Vietnamese exports have been rising at roughly 30% per annum 
in the last uh, 12 months since the shift of production went overseas. It went mostly to Vietnam and for cheaper goods to Bangladesh and India. Why do you think not Thailand? Why Vietnam instead? Well, I'm personally a bit surprised that not so much went to Thailand, but you see, the Thai baht, the currency has been very strong. So the country, because of the currency strength, is maybe a little bit less competitive than uh, Vietnam is at the present time. Not that the Vietnamese currency went down this year, it was stable. But on top of the strength in the Thai baht, the government here in its ultimate wisdom wants to increase uh, minimum wages. In other words, you have a strong currency and the government wants to increase wages. So the manufacturers, when they see the wage differential between Vietnam and here, they choose Vietnam. Plus, uh, the, in my view, the working attitude in Vietnam of the people is better than in Thailand. I kind of agree with that, yeah. Do you have a preference between investing in stocks of a country versus the currency? Why not just the currency instead of buying stocks? Yes, uh, I have an asset allocation for my clients, and I write about this almost every month. Essentially, the base position is 25% in real estate, 25% in equity stocks, 25% in bonds and cash, and 25% in uh, base, uh, I mean in uh, precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. And then each individual, he has to uh, kind of adjust this basic asset allocation to his personal needs, because some people, uh, they have most of their wealth in the house they live in. You understand, they buy a house, then they have a mortgage and sometimes they pay down the mortgage, sometimes they don't. But not everybody has uh, significant liquid assets that they can have really an efficient portfolio that I suggest, 25-25% and so forth. And even if you have the 25-25 portfolios, you still have to consider the currency. So in bonds and in equities, uh, you can shift your position uh, between, say, the US and uh, European companies in Europe that would be based uh, or would earn and the stock prices would be quoted in euros or in Canada and so forth. So you have to adjust this a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you have a house, say you buy a house in Canada, well, you know, you, when you think the Canadian dollar will go down, you can't sell your house and move to the US, buy a house there, uh, and when the US dollar is high, sell the house there and move back to Canada. You understand? Because you have a family and you have your friends and so forth. So that's a bit inconvenient. But you can hedge uh, your currency exposure. I don't hedge my currency exposure. I have also a diversified portfolio of currencies. But uh, when I feel that the currency, like I feel now that the dollar is very high and that the dollar will go down. By the way, the Canadian dollar this year is up by 3.5% against the US dollar. And to the surprise of many people, the pound sterling is up by 2% against the US dollar. The Thai baht by 7%. And because of all the problems in Ukraine, a cesspool of corruption that matches the corruption of Washington very well, the Ukraine hirna is up 15%. 15 against the US dollar. Not many currencies are up against the US dollar. Mm -hmm. I don't know any Latin American country that has a currency that strengthened against the US dollar. But Russia is up 8% and Ukraine uh, is up 
15%. It's very difficult to predict precisely the move in currencies, but if you can predict it halfway, you can make, uh, as you suggested, you can make essentially as much money out of currencies as out of stocks. What would be advice for someone that wants to do what you do now, that wants to start a fund and manage money for a client? What would be your main advice for that kind of person? Well, I think it's an advice that I can give to anyone who wants to start his own business. And somebody will say, well, I know cases uh, who went on their own uh, directly, like Steve Jobs. He probably never worked for anyone. He started his own business right away. But in general, I would say work for a company first. You can learn a lot in a corporation and you can uh, benefit initially from the corporation because they pay you a salary. And in my case, they send me to Asia. So they paid for my apartment. They paid for my traveling and so forth. I had to do it all by myself right from the start just to find the clients. I would have had to invest personally a lot of money to get to where I was after working for 20 years for corporations. So I think it's like a medical doctor. You go to university, uh, most medical doctors will then work in a hospital and learn from other doctors that have experience and knowledge. And once they become specialists, and uh, knowledgeable, they will maybe start their own consultancy. You understand? So I think it's uh, in former times, uh, well, in Switzerland, Germany, we still have the apprentice system. You make an apprentice with a goldsmith or with a carpenter or whatever it is, and you learn the trade from him. And once you have that knowledge and experience, you go on your own. So I think that a lot of young people should go and try, even at a low salary, as long as you can learn something from someone else. Or get a mentor that can help them yes. along the way. But you understand, if someone comes to me and says, Mark, can you please teach me? Then I say to him, yes, but I'm actually quite busy. And uh, I do a lot of things that involve my thinking. And I just don't have the time to teach you every day. Yeah. And You know, I see it with my daughter. She's a typical millennial. <laughs> I, she said she wanted to learn about uh, investment and uh, what I was doing. So I said, yes, yeah, sure. But, you know, you, it, it will take some effort on your side to learn this. And I tried to teach her for three months and send her research reports. But if she doesn't read them, then what do you do? I said to her after three months, look, I'm really wasting my time with you. I'm sorry to say, but this is the way. One evening, instead of learning, you say you have a party. Another evening, a friend is in town. Another evening, I have to do this, do that. Well, this is not the basis of learning. I also went to university once a while. I had to really sit down and work and forget about going to parties even nowadays. Many of my friends, they go out at night and so forth. I also go out. But when I have to write, I have to write because I have deadlines. It's a question of discipline in life. I'm all for drinking and partying and having a good time. But when you have to work, you have to work. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm curious to hear your perspective. So a lot of people ask, how can I get investors to invest in my trading or my investing? But I'm curious to know from your perspective, how do you think investors choose someone to manage their fund? How do they pick someone to manage their fund? I think, how do you pick a doctor? I think in life, despite all the bullshit about you know, electronic trading and so forth and so on, how do you pick a girlfriend? How do you pick a wife? You pick someone you like. Yeah. This is the most important in life. If you want to have clients, whether you're a doctor, a carpenter, a blacksmith, or an electrician, the most important is that you can establish a trust relationship. How do you go to bed with a girl? She must like you. 
or you must make a big payment. That also works, but you understand. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's a question of sympathies in life. And uh, I think a lot of young people misunderstand that. They try to have friends through the internet. Well, if you never meet someone, maybe, you know, once you talk to someone, maybe you meet someone you like, because he also likes to drink a beer with you, and somebody likes to drink wine and so forth. So you have uh, common interests and you have sympathies. And how do you find clients? You have to go and knock on doors. You know, this is a tough job at the beginning. Yeah. I'd say I visited thousands of people to get a handful of clients. You got to say it's like kind of like doing sales calls. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, sure. But a car salesman, he also has to be constantly on the phone and calling up his existing clients and say, look, we have a new model. Maybe you should exchange your old model for the new model and so forth. Yeah. It's a sales job. And I know uh, quite a few people in the watch industry and in luxury goods. Uh, they all are great salesmen. They can also organize something, you know, the, the manufacturing process. But a watch, how much does a watch cost to manufacture? A very expensive watch is maybe like a thousand dollars. And a more normal watch is maybe six hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars in manufacturing cost. And they sell them for twenty thousand. The difference between the 20,000 and the cost of manufacturing, which is less than a thousand, all goes into marketing, public relation, distributors, and so forth and so on. It's a bullshit business. But to get the brand, to get the recognition, is a major job. How do you present your investing and what you do to investors? Because they, they, they might not understand all the technical terms of investing and, and what you do. Well, initially, when I, first of all, I'm no longer looking for new clients. Mm. I still have some clients, but I'm not looking for new ones. And uh, the way I presented uh, or did the marketing is presenting something that was out of the ordinary. You know, not something that everybody else was saying. Uh, and then you say things or write about things that are maybe controversial or you write about things that nobody was thinking about. When I started out, I went to Asia. At the time, nobody was investing in Asia. Uh, the offices of Canadian and uh, American brokers and banks, European banks in Asia, was to get Asian money to invest in the US or in Canada or Australia. But I started to write early on about countries like South Korea, Taiwan, then the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia and China and so forth. And I tried to get foreign money, American money and European money to invest in Asia. And that was a novel thing to do at the time. And when Asia became expensive in the late 80s, before the crash, I started to go to Latin America because the Latin American markets were then very cheap because they had high inflation and the currencies had collapsed. And I started to write about Latin America. And then in, uh, when Russia began to open up <coughs> in 1989, 1990, I uh, went to Russia and started to write about Russia. So I kind of discovered several emerging economies that then provided very promising investment opportunities. It doesn't exist anymore nowadays. But as I said, when I wrote my book in 2001, the attractive sector were the commodity markets. And the theme was the opening of China, how this would change the world. And it seems different today for sure. Yeah. Yes. At the same time, aren't people afraid to invest if it's something new that they don't understand? Like, you, you tell them to invest in Asia if they don't know that before. Aren't they afraid as opposed to excited? I think people, are, different people are different. Some people are hesitant to invest in something where nobody else invests. But 
this was uh, described already early on in the economic uh, literature by an economist called Levingston. And uh, basically he said, you know, the psychology of people is very unusual. Say, in the first case, someone walks uh, in winter time on a very cold day and everything is frozen to a pond and the pond is covered with ice. If he is alone, he will be reluctant to step on the ice, even if the ice is very thick. But if at the same time he arrives to the pond, there is a village festival or party and the hundreds of people skating on the ice, without any thought he will walk across the ice. But when you think of it, if a hundred people are on the ice, the ice is much more likely to break than if only one person is on the ice. And this is, these are investment markets. If thousands of people invest in a stock, they don't think it's a risky proposition, they will do it. And if there is a sector that is neglected and nobody's interested, uh, they will only reluctantly invest in that sector. But you as an investment advisor, if you are a good salesman, you can uh, tell a prospective client, you say, look, these are my ideas. I don't ask you to put all your money into my ideas, but why don't you put, say, 10% of your money in my idea? If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, then, you know, too bad. Mm -hmm. You can kill me. <laughs> you can shoot me next time you see me. <laughs> I think that's a good example, though. Did you ever have any, not bad relationship, but tough time with investors that are either too demanding or too um, stressed? Look, I think in whatever profession you are, you will have some nice clients and some not so nice clients, believe me. And uh, in life, you have to try to get rid of people that cause you a lot of headaches and problems. You can have a client that is difficult, but if he's intelligent, you can learn something from him because he will ask intelligent questions. But if you have a pain in the neck that complains every time there is a transaction or about everything and calls your assistant every day or calls you every day, better get rid of him. Because the good clients, the large clients, will not do that. Because a good client, he knows, I want something from my investment advisor. Uh, I want a good service from him. So I have to respect his time as well, that he is busy. He doesn't have the time to talk to me every day five times. And uh, I have to also consider that occasionally there can be misunderstandings and a mistake can happen. And then we can negotiate how to solve the problem. But some clients, they don't realize that. And uh, therefore, I think the best is to get rid of them. Because one client, he can uh, disturb you so much that you then neglect uh, your job, which is really to appraise the markets and opportunities. So I think it's very important uh, that you have maybe difficult clients in terms of they are challenging your view. That's okay. It's good if you only have lemmings that only listen to you and uh, never question anything. You will become negligent. But if you have a difficult pain in the neck, then it's better to get rid of him. That's awesome. I think that was a really good advice. I mean, I, the, not the other day, but a year ago, someone came to my office and he had something like $50 million. And he wanted me to look after it. But I noticed he's a difficult, unpleasant character. And I said to myself, do I really need this in my life at my stage? You know, I don't really need to earn more money. I really need to kind of keep what I have and make it a small living. 
And uh, so I turned him down. I think in life, you know, it's very important to be energetic and have initiative, but it's also important to know when to stop and when to say no. You know, it's like with women, sometimes you have to say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you were starting out with your business, would you accept the client or would you turn him down? I think that's when that you kind of get over time. Yeah, yeah, you get to push people away. I think at the beginning you have to take flies, you, you understand? Uh, because the devil, if he's hungry, he eats flies. So at the beginning you have to take essentially everybody. But after a while, uh, and many clients that, if, if I go and solicit business, I may not know how much money he's got, whether he's lying, he can tell you, look, I start with you, I give you $100,000. And by the way, when I started as an investment uh, manager, $100,000 was already quite a large account. You know, the average account at Merrill Lynch at the time was like $5,000. So uh, he may start to say, okay, I start with you, I'll give you $100,000, and if you do well, we can increase it to a million and maybe more and so forth. You understand? Mm. But a lot of people then don't do it. So at the beginning you take what you can get and some clients will then surprise you with how much more money they will invest with you and some will disappoint you. And the ones that disappoint you but bother you all the time, you better get rid of them. I mean, in every profession, time is money. And in Japan, the women in the nightclubs, they say, bimbo himanashi, no time for the poor man. I mean, it's a, you know, it's maybe sounds to some people unfair, but this is the reality of life. In business, it is about making ends meet. You have expenditures, you have to cover these expenditures, and you have to make a living. And if you waste the whole time uh, with people that don't pay, and waste your time, you will never make it, you understand? Mm -hmm. You will go bankrupt. So you have to focus on people that uh, may be demanding, but they pay for your time. It's like a doctor, it's nice to say, oh, I want to treat poor people. Yeah, but if nobody pays you, what are you going to do? That's good wisdom. And, uh, and an artist, he can say, well, I like to produce art for my own pleasure. Yeah, if he's got money from his parents, he can do that. But another one who starts out as an artist, uh, it's important for him to sell a painting from time to time. Not everybody wants to live like Van Gogh or Renoir. <laughs> They lived in poverty. A lot of good wisdom. So we talk about your story, we talk about uh, lessons about clients and everything, investing, uh, portfolio, that's awesome. So I appreciate you very much, Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have any questions, you can comment below the video and we'll answer your question. Okay. And I'll catch you guys pretty soon.